I'm, I'm hearing a, a, a parallel between some of your thinking um, in, in customer development and, and iterating a minimal viable product to your, your personal experience with, with challenges or your, your personal experience with things that um, you know, could seem like a setback and, and might make you, you leave what you're doing. In other words, um, when you're developing a product and you get negative feedback, rather than interpret it as the end of the world, interpret it as this big opportunity to change and adjust and create something, and you, you apply that thinking to your personal life. Um, is that right? Um, it, it does that, it That's does an astute it, observation, it, and it, it not only applies to me, it's actually a bigger observation about founders. Not about employees of early stage companies, but founders. You know, we use the word resilient, and, and what you just heard was a story of someone being resilient of integrating the, the failures into this, but that is a characteristic of entrepreneurs. But I'm about to make another connection that, that I'm surprised people don't make. It's a characteristic of artists as a class. If you really think about it, you know, artists are driven not by success, but by the need to take something inside. Whether it's I hear something that no one else hears, I see something, you know, or, or I envision a play or whatever. There are a class of people who are wired for creation. They're just different than everybody else's mindset who are wired for execution or you know some entertainment or something else and because they're driven by this passion for creation that passion will get them through you know I, my co-founder quit my biggest customer decided that you know pulled the order and whatever or people hated my paintings that they thought my my latest music sucked it doesn't matter you keep going you keep going not because you're resilient for the sake of resilient but you're resilient for the sake of, you've got a bigger, a bigger vision than just that moment in time. Because if you let those moments of failure get in your way, as an entrepreneur, as a founder, you'll quit the first time the stuff hits the fan. Because you know, unlike the popular view of entrepreneurship nowadays, it's a miserable job. It's mostly going from failure to failure, not, at, you know, most people aren't Zuckerberg or even a thousandth uh, of, of a successful founder. You're better off working at McDonald's, if, in fact, in your lifetime, for 95% of founders. And if you're doing it for the money or because it's cool or whatever, you will not get um, to the end point. It's kind of a zen-like thing. Does that answer quite? Absolutely. Uh, and I wonder if you think, or if you've observed you know, in your personal experience or um, from other founders, um, ways to cultivate that kind of resilience um, sure. personally or um, through the work you're doing as an entrepreneur? Well, one of the, um, one of the sad ways to cultivate it is it turns out that um, um, a disproportionate number of successful founders come from dysfunctional families. Um, it turns out if you're a survivor of a dysfunctional family that is operating in chaos for survival, it turns out that's a perfect skills training for operating in the role of a founding CEO. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's nothing predictable about an early stage venture and I mean, you can read all the books and watch all these videos and whatever but until you encounter that that chaos yeah, you don't have no idea what it is and I remind um, founders th th who come from dysfunctional families is that probably for the first time in their lives they have a competitive advantage and if you've come from a normal you know everything you know is kind of set and your life is kind of, you're gonna be a little surprised because uh, that's not what a, you know, this is not a day job. It doesn't mean you can't run a startup if, if you haven't had that training, but you ask, what kind of skills training? Turns out if you've been in combat, um, which is why I think veterans uh, or people who've been in the military have an unfair advantage of, you know, trying to work through a situation where here is the book, but, you know, the situation on the ground looks nothing like that. You've got to make it up in real time. And if you're not comfortable doing that, if you can't assess a situation, you know, assimilate the data, figure out what pattern, and then move, you don't have time for, you know, meetings and decisions and whatever. Because in a startup, the other thing that's never, I think, been adequately under, understood and described, there's a sense of urgency because you have a gun to your head. And that gun to your head is called burn rate because eventually you run out of money and everybody in your room, they're going home. Uh, that's very different than anything people have encountered in large companies or in your personal life unless you come out of those chaotic situations. Yeah. And by dysfunctional families, there's another case where I, I see it from my foreign students. 
Um, rising above, gee, I grew up in a village in either India or China, or I'm the first generation or whatever, and I've made it to Stanford and Berkeley and whatever. It's that same kind of, while it wasn't uh, physical or verbal abuse, it was the same kind of striving through a chaotic, and now I'm speaking English, standing in front of the, you know, boy, that's a long journey. That's also great training for, you know, what it's like in the day in the life of a founder. Sure. And, and, and by the way, I'm not suggesting that those are the only paths to entrepreneurship, but I'm suggesting it's surprising that those things a actually are benefits rather than impediments uh, in that. 